Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ariel. And uh, I, I would like to thank the uh, Trivia of University and your department. And also, uh, in particular, uh, Dr. Kadenanga, um, who was a, a graduate student at the University of Saskatchewan for arranging uh, this talk this morning. It's, it's uh, morning here and afternoon there. So uh, this would have been a uh, long trip in the past uh, to come out to give a seminar, so now with the electronics, we can do it more easily. Anyway, um, there's an area of common interest between Nepal and Canada, and that is the hydrology of the high mountains. Uh, uh, we both have high mountains. Yours are much higher than ours, but these uh, are incredibly important for the uh, water resources of our country, and uh, both are being subject to climate change. So I will. Uh, Try to share my screen and, and then get start the slide presentation. Okay, great. <clears throat> so hopefully you can see the opening scene. Um, uh, this is a uh, uh, photograph from Canmore, Alberta, and uh, this is the cold water laboratory out there, which we've had running now for just over 10 years um, and uh, where Dr. Pradnanga spent a lot of his time. It's not that whole building at all. It's just a few offices on the lower floor, but it's a, it's a wonderful research group and uh, we have uh, very good people that get out into the mountains and, and take some good measurements and, and understand, and try to improve our understanding and our ability to predict these things. So the, uh, we, problems we have in common between our countries and many other areas are the water security challenges associated with global mountain climate change. Uh, the, the rivers uh, tend to leave the high mountains mostly pristine, but uh, rapidly become degraded with water quality, agricultural runoff, industry sewage. And there's competition for high mountain water uh, between subnational provinces and between nation states, uh, which can sometimes lead to stress and uh, challenges around the world. The, um, we also uh, have had in increasing risks from extreme events, uh, particularly uh, intense rainfall in the mountains, uh, rapid snowmelt, uh, glacial lake out outburst floods, uh, geomorphological hazards, landslides, and um, these have caused serious problems. Uh, the photograph in the middle is Calgary, Alberta in uh, June 2013. Uh, this is a city of 1.2 million. It's uh, one of the, I think, fourth largest in Canada. And, uh, but that was Canada's most expensive flooding disaster with $6 billion of damage and some loss of life. And it was due to a, a heavy rainfall, including rain on snow, on the Canadian Rocky Mountains, which are to the west of Calgary. So, um, so we, we have uh, severe damages from these things. <clears throat> We're also seeing increasing decoupling of streamflow regimes from the timing of snowmelt and glacier melt as rainfall begins to dominate in formerly mountains that were formerly dominated by the cryosphere, by snow and ice. And um, in some areas, uh, the, uh, the use immediately downstream of water is unsustainable. It's simply too high and it creates problems when we have droughts um, or, uh, and can lead to uh, transboundary conflicts as well. And then uh, we, we have unprecedented climate and environmental change occurring in the mountains. Uh, changes in our vegetation cover, changes in glacier cover, associated with this declining snowpacks, more rainfall, and in many cases amplified climate change in the high mountains. Uh, things are warmer up high uh, than they are uh, at lower elevations. <clears throat> and so this creates problems far outside of the high mountain region itself into uh, vast population areas downstream that have developed through the, uh, the advent of irrigation over uh, uh, many thousands of years of, of human history. So uh, here's work from Daniel Fivaroli from, it, uh, from Switzerland uh, looking at 
uh, the mountain water services, the water services that are provided by high mountains around the world. And so you can see the vast area in Asia, which has a uh, um, high to medium uh, contrib contributing potential to lowland areas. This is why Isimod is in Nepal, of course, um, but also in Europe, uh, large areas and uh, some that have some water stress uh, through the Andes uh, in South America and then up the Cordillera from the US into Canada. Um, the uh, notwithstanding other parts of the world such as upland Africa and uh, areas in uh, Indonesia and New Zealand. In Canada, our situation, we have several rivers uh, leaving the main Rockies range here. Uh, we have uh, some semi-arid areas downstream, uh, but many of the areas downstream are not so dry, so it's not a, a dire water shortage uh, such as a country like Spain might exhibit, but it's uh, very important for our aquatic ecosystems and we have expanding irrigation now as Canada warms up, so increasing food production that will rely upon this water. So there's uh, global urgency and significance to understanding the snow hydrology of the high mountains. Um, we have melting cryosphere, the ecosystems are changing, um, the, uh, the, the virtual dams that snow and glacier provide uh, to help manage our water, uh, we're losing these. And so we may need different water management uh, approaches. And of course, we have acceleration of the high mountain hydrological cycle, which is moving stream flow timing earlier in the year and increasing flood risk as rainfall becomes a more important part of our precipitation regime. And this all impacts the sustainability of mountain communities and downstream communities uh, for their food, water, and energy security. I, I should mention that this is uh, part of the reason that we formed something called INARCH, the International Network uh, for Alpine Research Catchment Hydrology. Uh, Dr. Pradnanga is a member of this, and the uh, Langtang catchment is, uh, is part of this network. It's on, part of the World Climate Research Program through the Global Energy and Water Exchanges Experiment. And, the, uh, and it links up uh, researchers and research basins around the world in the high mountains so that we can better understand and model and measure uh, the hydrology of these regions, uh, including both snow and glacier hydrology. And the, uh, we were going to have a uh, meeting in Spain at the end of March. Of course, that's been canceled. And so we need to find new ways to revive these international networks. So a webinar like this is a good way to do this. Uh, um, and I'll show you some results in this network later in the presentation. So back into Canada, the uh, Canadian Rockies uh, run through this area and are the uh, height of land for North America. There are two triple point continental divides in the uh, Canadian Rockies and the American Rockies just to the south. Um, one where the Mississippi River uh, drainage takes off to the southeast, one where the Saskatchewan River takes off towards Hudson Bay, one where the Mackenzie goes north uh, to the Arctic Ocean and uh, from the Columbia River heading uh, west and south into British Columbia and the northwest to the United States. And if you go further north, you'll find the headwaters of the Yukon River as well. So this uh, western, northwestern Cordillera is incredibly important for the continental hydrology of North America. And if we can understand how uh, the hydrological cycle works in this region, then we can uh, calculate the major flows of several rivers crossing the continent. Uh, that serve uh, water for hundreds of millions of people. <clears throat> However, we also have water stress in Canada. Um, this uh, picture on the upper left is Canmore, Alberta in June 2013. Uh, a creek called Cougar Creek is normally dry, but it was not dry then and uh, damaging houses and homes uh, due to heavy rain and rapid snowmelt at that time. But then just a few years later, here's a creek above the town of Canmore, and you see it's bone dry. And in, in that year, there were terrible fires in Alberta, including the destruction of part of Fort McMurray, a city of 80,000 people uh, through wildfire and uh, record fires in the mountains in British Columbia. So uh, we have uh, rapid changes and these fires can leave uh, dark deposits of soot on our snow and ice. You see this, uh, glacier here, um, uh, absolutely covered with, uh, with soot and now algae living on that, but also darkens the snow 
and destroys the forest. So many hydrological implications here as well as soil disturbances. Let's uh, zoom into the Canadian Rockies. So we, we determined uh, several decades ago we needed to understand uh, the water phenomena in the Rockies better. And there was no uh, science base in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. Uh, uh, nothing like ECMOD that you have in Nepal or the uh, organizations in China or India. So we, uh, we set up a base in a small town, Canmore, Alberta, uh, which is next to uh, several national parks which uh, formed together, I think, the one of the largest UNESCO World Heritage Sites in the world, uh, the Canadian Rocky Mountains uh, UNESCO area. So Banff, Yoho, Kootenai, and Jasper National Park. And these have great high glaciated areas, um, the uh, other high mountains, uh, vast forests, and natural ecosystems. So it's good we have the national parks at the headwaters of our major rivers. Um, and uh, so what we did was we started setting up a number of meteorological stations. Uh, you see one here at Fortress Mountain in Alberta um, in the Alpine. Here's another one in the forest where we're hanging a tree by a uh, load cell, an electronic load cell, so we can weigh the interception of rain and snow on that tree. You see the bottom is cut. So th this is a, a wonderful experimental area for us that we operate from the University of Saskatchewan in cooperation with the Canadian government, the government of Alberta, and uh, with several other universities as collaborators. <clears throat> one thing that we notice when we look at the regimes of uh, the major rivers from here, one is the Bow River, which flows from Banff National Park to Calgary, Alberta, then on to Saskatchewan to form the Saskatchewan River. And if we plot up the hydrographs of the Bow River over its 100 year record of stream flow, uh, we see the very high events occur in May and June and uh, peak flows then and then flows dropping in July to lower flows and low flow in the winter when it's very cold. And uh, we can then uh, look at that record over time and uh, look at when the high flows occurred. Is there a shift in timing? And then also uh, when, when did the high, um, the median and the low flows occur. And it can be hard to detect trends in this looking uh, visually, but when we break it into five day periods, and this is work that uh, uh, Paul Whitfield worked on, we find that in late summer, the flows are all significantly declining uh, from uh, midsummer on, and that we have some significant increases in flows in early spring. And uh, so this is typical uh, climate change signal. We have declining glaciers causing reduced flows in here, but also decline, perhaps earlier snowmelt um, causing flow decline in here, and perhaps uh, earlier snowmelt increasing flow in here. So perhaps we're seeing a regime shift because of the change in the timing of snowmelt and the duration of snow cover in these mountains. Um, we know for the Bull River, the uh, glacier contribution is about 2% of the annual flow uh, the glaciers are already uh, very small and in bad situation. I believe Dr. Uh, Pradnaga has uh, given you a seminar on the glaciers in this region and his, his work on modeling them. So I will focus on the snow instead. So there's a hydrological cycle and it's a bit modified in cold regions. Hydrological cycle, I think you know well, we have to deal with rainfall, evapotranspiration, runoff, snowfall. But in cold regions, we have to deal with storage of uh, water as, snow, as a seasonal snowpack. Some of it doesn't melt and becomes uh, uh, permanent ice. The, uh, we have other processes such as frozen ground infiltration, which uh, restricts the infiltration potential of, of mineral soils. Uh, we might have permafrost in very cold areas where the soils do not thaw in the year. Um, and in uh, snow processes, we would have uh, blowing snow and sublimation of snow in the high alpine areas, interception of snow and forest canopies along with rain. Um, we often have organic soils uh, forming interflow for runoff processes with uh, overland flow over uh, exposed bedrock. <clears throat> and uh, we can also have interflow through talus slopes. So it's a somewhat modified hydrological cycle, but what's particularly relevant to it is that there are phase changes between all these elements here, between evaporation, 
uh, and water between sublimation and snow, uh, between snow and liquid water, and, um, and between uh, frozen ground and uh, liquid in the ground. And we often, it's usually a multi-phase system in that even at very cold temperatures, you can always find a little bit of liquid water in the porous media in the soils or in the snowpack. And, um, and often even in uh, midsummer, you can find something frozen, uh, perhaps permafrost or, or a late line snow patch or a glacier in the area. So uh, these are complex systems with uh, coupled heat and mass exchanges. Um, but they, that also gives a predictability to the hydrology, which gives us an advantage in snowy and uh, cold regions of the world because uh, we can bring in the energy equation as well as the mass balance equation for the solutions uh, to our hydrological systems. And it imposes an important constraint upon the, uh, these solutions. And it means that we can use uh, physics-based models with success in these areas and also rely on the seasonality of solar radiation um, and the uh, seasonality of some weather patterns uh, and the fact that snowmelt is slower, more widespread and more predictable than intense rainfall, which sometimes is missed by our meteorological models. So <clears throat> one thing we uh, emphasize very strongly at a meeting last October at the World Meteorological Organization was the need to integrate observation and prediction systems in high mountains. Uh, to have one without the other uh, leaves uh, benefits uh, undeveloped, which could be quite helpful. So um, much as your department has done in the, in the Mount Everest region, we need these high mountain stations, but then we also need, uh, you know, calculations, modeling of complex terrain wind flow. We need uh, airborne and, and satellite observations of what's occurring on the surface. We need distributed modeling of these systems and bringing these together can be very, very powerful and was uh, in fact adopted as a part of a, a, a resolution from uh, WMO as to an approach for better understanding the hydrology and climate change impacts in high mountain regions. So I'm glad to see it's being adopted in Nepal and, and then uh, research areas such as Langtang are an excellent way forward for this as well. The, uh, when we uh, go have started in the Canadian Rockies to look at what was controlling the hydrology there, we noticed uh, blowing snow off the high mountain ridges, often redistributing snow into deep drifts in areas. We noticed interception of snow in the forest canopy. The snow would be held for uh, days to weeks in cold weather, even months, and subject to sublimation uh, back to the atmosphere and when things became warm and humid, then uh, melt and drip uh, down to the forest canopy below. Both uh, are important hydrological processes where the forest uh, interacts with the snowpack to uh, uh, really change the dynamics at the Earth's surface. And so it's an important role by which forests manage their own water and uh, then affect uh, uh, river basin flows. Where we have steep terrain, uh, we'll have avalanching and uh, snow just falling off. And of course, the late line snowpacks in this area can be very important. This one here, the snow lasts all summer, uh, typically till September, and provides a, a recharge to groundwater lakes. You, you can see the same slope in here late in summer, and uh, still some snow sitting there from the avalanching. It's uh, providing preferential flow on alpine talus slopes. Uh, that feed groundwater systems and into lakes. So uh, it's important to have and know where this is occurring. We've been also developing sensors to help measure snow. Uh, one is called Kioni, and uh, Kioni uh, from a Greek name for a snow god, but it's not a god, it's just a, it's just a box, uh, a box with a, a, a speaker and a microphone, and then some very sophisticated signal processing and the, uh, it sends an audible sound signal into the snowpack below, um, and which is then reflected from the bottom of the snowpack back up. And from that, we can measure the uh, depth, the density, the temperature, the wetness, and the layering of the snowpack um, using uh, uh, similar principles that you use for geophysical prospecting and sonar. So that's uh, something we've been developing and, and we're in the midst of testing across Canada from deep snowpacks to shallow and cold snowpacks. 
here are some early tests of Keone uh, compared to a, um, a dielectric device and to a, um, a gamma uh, device for measuring snow water equivalent. These are just different signal processing, but, uh, and then uh, snow pits, which are the ones that you can believe are the black dots, but it's not too bad. And uh, for getting the density, again, not too bad. And, uh, and for getting depth, again, not too bad in general. So uh, we have some encouraging results from Keone and uh, it might eventually replace the need to dig a snow pit, uh, which would uh, make many, many people very happy, not everyone. Uh, snow pits are still fun, but, uh, um, but it's been useful. Another thing that we did early on was um, become uh, worked with some uh, LIDAR researchers uh, to deploy LIDAR to measure snow depth uh, back in uh, 2007. And, uh, and so this was really opened our eyes to the uh, deep drifts. Uh, you see these drifts deeper than three meters in areas here along the mountain uh, crest, and then also the role of trees and forest in uh, controlling that snow distribution. This is Fisera Ridge, which I'll talk about later. It's just part of Marmot Creek. It's a high alpine ridge. It gets very deep snow drifts on the south facing slope here. It's wind scoured on the top and on the north face and uh, has been a uh, scientific uh, gold mine for us to better understand what's going on there. <coughs> but this, <coughs> excuse me, this LIDAR image itself, incredibly important for us. And now uh, we have new ways to do this. We, uh, we still have airborne LIDAR over these areas uh, with a colleague, Brian Menounos, uh, who flies that, but sometimes we want high resolution LIDAR. And so we've been uh, putting uh, LIDAR systems on UAVs, on drones, and flying them over the area. We've also put Keone on a drone uh, to sample the snowpack. You see it here. That's still an experimental product, but uh, we're hoping to really expand snow surveys if we can get millions of depths from a drone like this, and then the density and wetness and temperature from a drone like that, uh, then it, things get very exciting indeed. But they're already exciting. Uh, this is Fortress Ridge in the, in the Canadian Rockies, and just a kind of a raw image to, you can see the forest here. This is an uh, unused ski area, so you see ski runs through here, and then a high mountain ridge, and we have a weather station right up here. And, uh, but the, uh, here's, that view from a different angle here. We've overlaid snow depth and the deep blue depths are six meter uh, depths of snow here. And then lighter colors are scoured and very shallow. And then you can see the forest canopy through here as well. So this makes a wonderful place to study forest snow interactions. Uh, some of the deep drifts we see in the forest near the tree line to the more shallow snow as you get further down. And then of course the deep uh, side drifts here. So. We have a number of weather stations here and we've been conducting uh, meteorological experiments on preferential deposition uh, with Julie, uh, Professor Julie Thoreau out of uh, University of Quebec in Montreal. And, um, and then also on uh, uh, fine scale modeling of this. And this, so it's a very good place to test our hydrological models with these measurements because we can map out uh, things such as the change in snow depth over this area. And, um, and so here you see the uh, accumulation of drifts over this period in time, while at the same time we have snow melt on this uh, south facing slope in here. So, it's, uh, so we have both accumulation and melt at the same time. Um, a large scale model will try to assign an average value to this. And <clears throat> sometimes we need to have better subgrid information than that. And this allows us to develop those subgrid parameterizations for models. So how does snow blow off mountains? Well, the, this has been a subject of investigation for us um, in Canada as well as Nepal. Uh, sometimes you get a blizzard up high. It's an exciting and dangerous event. And uh, hydrologically, it uh, re redistributes snow from one side of the mountain to the other and from high elevations to low elevations. The blowing snow mechanisms are, are sediment transport mechanisms, uh, similar to what you would have in uh, rivers uh, with saltation or by uh, blowing sand or dust with saltation along the ground within the lowest few centimeters and then su turbulent suspension of, of snow particles up tens or maybe hundreds of meters above. So um, on the left hand side here, you see 
uh, mostly saltating snow blowing into a small catchment in Yukon, Canada. And, um, and here now you see uh, that snow becoming suspended uh, well above the surface. So uh, this, uh, this redistribution of snow imposes those uh, um, subgrid variability, creating the deep drifts that it can be so important for late summer water supply. And, uh, but it's also sublimating while it's blowing. And this is where it differs from rivers that have been transported or aeolian erosion. And the sublimation rates can be very high. Uh, investigators such as de Union in the former Soviet Union, Schmidt and Tabler in the United States were amongst the first to recognize the rapid sublimation of blowing snow and its impact on water resources. And in some alpine regions, it can, we can lose 20 to 30% of snowfall to sublimation of blowing snow. So it can be very important. On that same Fisera Ridge, the snow water equivalent that you get uh, depends upon where you are. So up on the ridge top, maybe just uh, 80 millimeters. Uh, but as you go down to the drifts, uh, 600, 750 millimeters. And on the scoured north face down to 100 millimeters. So tremendous redistribution over that. But then also sublimation losses uh, from the uh, sites that are scoured of blowing snow. In this case, we're losing um, uh, 25 to um, 40 percent of the snowfall over the year to sublimation of blowing snow. So it needs to be considered as part of the water balance, as well as a, that important redistribution process. We wanted to study this better, and uh, so what we did was uh, we took a laser up there, and uh, see the laser green light here. This is an eddy correlation system, and this is a high-speed camera. And uh, so a student of mine, Nicholas Exama, uh, we had to do this at night, and uh, during blizzards, you wear laser goggles. So we had a little shelter that we could shelter in. And, uh, but this provided fantastic information on the particle physics and the particle trajectories during blowing snow near the ground in an alpine environment. And uh, I'll show you a result of that camera setup. Uh, these are, um, this is blowing snow initiation. And so you see the particles being shattered as they uh, impact the surface. You see the impact of turbulent bursts from the atmosphere down to the surface that is driving the uh, initial ejection of the particles and then the uh, sweeping in and then um, and, and then as they're swept out the uh, that transports the particles and eventually helps them uh, loft up into a suspended layer so it's a fascinating process this is all occurring within a few millimeters of the surface over uh, I think less than a second I'm showing you here but um, but it's, uh, it's helped us to understand this as a very unsteady process, but also one that can entrain large amounts of warm, dry air near the surface to drive sublimation. So um, it's improving, those types of measurements help improve our physical understanding. Other measurements that are helpful to us have been uh, the habit I have of hanging trees. Uh, I guess I've been doing it now since the early 1990s. Uh, it's a wonderful way to study the sublimation and interception of snow and forest canopies. And so this tree, we cut it with a chainsaw. You see it's cut off here and we tar the bottom and then we hang it from a load cell on this tower. And so we can weigh the snow on a tree like this. That's probably 10 kilograms of snow on a single tree. And it can also help us estimate the sublimation of that snow and its melt or drip at the lower canopy and also any of that snow that blows off out of the canopy. And we, uh, we find uh, much deeper uh, snowpacks in forest clearings than we in the forest itself near the clearings. Uh, this is uh, four snow survey transects in Marmot Creek in the Rockies. And uh, this suggests that we have about 60% sublimation loss at this uh, period of time. And we find with measurements from around the world, uh, the parametric models modeling uh, Russian data the blue points are Canadian data, and this is looking at the ratio of snow in the forest to snow in the clearing, and uh, as a function of the leaf area index. So a dense spruce canopy would be a four, uh, more open pine canopy a two, and then these would be forest clearings, and as you get to zero, then it's, there's no forest. But we, uh, we see that uh, for the densest forest, we can get up to about 50% difference in snowpack on the ground. And uh, the difference in these cold forests is almost entirely due to sublimation losses from the forest canopy. 
being much higher than from snow on the ground. There have been uh, different experiments to compare sublimation losses around the world. And in the Canadian Rockies, we're around 60%, which appear to be some of the highest, but Alto in Switzerland, around 33%, uh, boreal forest, 14 to 17%, uh, Colorado, uh, Fraser in Colorado, 37, 38%. So depending where you are, uh, there are some high values in many places. It's uh, not a well-studied phenomenon, but again, very important role of forests in controlling snow hydrology. Now, as we move to snow melt, uh, snow melt is driven not so much by air temperature, but by solar radiation. And uh, it's uh, complex to calculate because we have to look at the energy flows to the snowpack from uh, absorption, reflection of solar radiation, the uh, absorption of long wave radiation and its emission, which is also very important. And then the turbulent transfer of heat, sensible heat. Uh, this is where air temperature directly affects the snowpack. And, uh, and due to sublimation uh, cooling, uh, water vapor transfer and uh, latent heat cooling due to the sublimation during water vapor transfer. There's also exchange with the ground, but the snowpack is a tremendous energy store. And so the internal energy state of that snowpack is very important. This is some work that Chris DeBeer did um, using uh, ground-based uh, time-lapse photography uh, wrapped over a landscape. This is upper Marmot Creek here. And uh, here's a south facing slope, a north facing slope, and a little uh, creek valley in here. And looking at the snow cover depletion change between April and May, you see the south facing slope is becoming bare. And this allows us to look at the, uh, the melt rates and how they distribute over this alpine basin. And so south facing slopes melting first, but then becoming patchy. And then as they become patchy and depleted, then melt rates start to increase on the north facing slopes. So it's a sequence here, and that sequence is controlled by the energy inputs to the snowpack. Of course, when snow becomes patchy, it can have advection of energy from uh, warm ground around it, and that advection can add additional energy to the snowpacks, uh, particularly when conditions are dry. So uh, lots of things going on here to calculate the melt rate, yet uh, many physically based uh, snow melt models are quite successful now and uh, we can operate them in many situations. We can calculate slope and aspect, we can calculate shading, we can calculate wind flow and therefore differences in turbulent transfer. And with high resolution meteorological models, uh, we find models at four kilometers resolution or smaller uh, that we can get very good calculations of the melt rate over complex terrain. When you have the forest canopy, uh, there are further complications in here. Uh, the canopy itself, uh, means that uh, we have short wave absorption uh, near the top of the canopy, but long wave emission near the bottom and uh, reduced turbulent transfer under the forest canopy. And this generally means snow melt rates are three times slower under the forest canopy than they would be in an open area. Uh, but it depends on slope and aspect as well, as I'll show you. And um, so here's um, two slopes in Marmot Creek. One is snow free, uh, south slope face, ridge top, north face. <clears throat> and then here's one with forest, south face, ridge top, north face. So we look at the role of the forest canopy. And uh, these are this is the snow water equivalent on these, the north face and uh, uh, and this has uh, in this case there's no uh, no blowing snow losses the uh, snow is presumed to be held in place. But the, uh, uh, the level on the north face accumulate almost all the snow and then melt later in the year. The south face has uh, melting events for the winter and then melts earlier if it's open. If they're forested though, we have lower snowpack because of interception of snow, but we also have homogenized conditions for subcanopy energy on the snowpack. And this is because of the emission of long wave radiation by the canopy and um, and the uh, only 10% of shortwave radiation gets through these dense forests. So they're mostly just emitted long wave to melt the snowpack. So there's less snow to begin with because of sublimation, but then homogenized energy regime under the snowpack. And so we get melt at almost the same time in there. This means if you clear cut a forest like this, you're going to get much more snow, uh, but also snow melting at different times. And that has great hydrological importance. It may not be a clear cut, it could be the result of a wildfire 
or the death of a forest uh, due to uh, warming conditions, a beetle, a pine beetle is a problem for us. So uh, there are many reasons forest covers can change, but you can desynchronize the snowmelt delivery over a forest, over a, a mountain basin, and but also provide much deeper snowpacks that way. In Colorado, they used to actually clear cut the headwaters of the Colorado River Basin on purpose to try to get these uh, deep snowpacks in here. And uh, I don't think they do it anymore, but the, uh, as a way to engineer a high mountain watershed, but it inadvertently is an impact of wildfire. So then we wonder how fast does water flow through the snow? And uh, Sam Kolbeck and others, uh, many researchers in Japan and in Europe have worked on this problem for many years. Uh, we wanted to approach it. This is uh, Nicolas Leroux, a uh, graduate student who's now a uh, postdoctoral researcher in Montreal. And here we put blue dye on top of the snowpack and we melted it with a hot plate hooked to a generator. This is heat tape here to create artificial snow melt. And you can see the unsteady pattern of flow through snow. It's very heterogeneous flow. Uh, water flows along these flow fingers of preferential flow and uh, um, some of that meltwater advances beyond the, the wetting front for the rest of the matrix, which is back here. But you also see the impact of layering in the snowpack. So the uh, meltwater hits one of these layers, which may have ice in it. It's an impeding layer, uh, water ponds, until we can find a way through, it then hits the net layer of ponds and comes through. For cold snow, this water may also refreeze while this occurs. So this can really delay the transmission of water through uh, deep mountain snowpacks, and it's important when we're trying to predict uh, the stream flow generation from melting snow. So um, uh, Dr. Leroux has uh, produced a uh, preferential flow model uh, for water through snow, and uh, I'll show it again there. Um, and so you can see several impeding layers, and then the preferential flow zones, the flow fingers in this uh, particular model. Uh, the most recent version of the model has the uh, uh, entry, air entry pressure into dry snow uh, uh, properly formulated as, as well as a, a Richards uh, equation solution for this problem. So, uh, so we're trying to simplify this enough to go into general hydrological models. Not quite there yet, but it's coming. Now, why are we interested in uh, water movement through snow so quickly? Well, we've had uh, the most expensive natural disaster in Canadian history up and at that time uh, was the Calgary flood of 2013. We had as much as 300 millimeters of precipitation in the mountains in the Canadian Rockies here, and uh, that caused the flooding in Calgary I showed earlier. And it occurred in late June, but we still had snow around, so it was a rain on snow event as well. And uh, here we are, uh, my technician May Guan, and just at that time you see the remaining snowpacks in the alpine area of Marmot Creek. So. Uh, to better understand this event, we decided we needed to model it. And so the model uh, we chose is one we've been developing for several decades. It's a modular, flexible, object-oriented hydrological model uh, that allows us to configure it differently for different purposes called the Cold Regions Hydrological Model. And it has all the warm season processes that every hydrological model has, but it also has the ones that I talked about as snowmelt infiltration, interception, blowing snow, avalanches, um, uh, thaw of frozen soils, <clears throat> and, uh, and others. So it's a, uh, it's an, uh, a very important um, model for us. And uh, this is showing the thaw uh, calculation, which is uh, very important where we have frozen ground. And we've been able to deploy this in many parts of Canada and other parts of the world. I understand your university is using it with the work of Dr. Pradhananga who is one of the developers of this model. He developed it for the glacier environment. So in this case, we can use it to help understand the rain on snow processes and the uh, changing flow regime. So here you see the pre-flood event. Uh, we're getting a little bit of snow melt every day and that's going into groundwater and subsurface flow. And stream flows are very low, around five millimeters of discharge per day. Um, now here comes on June 19th, the start of the flood uh, with heavy rain, uh, 40 millimeters that day, uh, and snow melt still going on. And then uh, um, some charging of the snowpack with uh, rainwater. And then uh, over 100 millimeters the next day of rain, and then 60 millimeters the third day. 
but now um, greater snowmelt concentrations. And uh, by the time we get to the fourth day, uh, now we're also getting uh, some snowfall occurring as well um, uh, as rainfall drops off. But now changing hydrological pathways. So the uh, uh, evaporation stays about the same, didn't increase during that event. Uh, subsurface runoff uh, began to increase, but here we see a rapid increase in a flow process which was not occurring before the flood, and that's overland flow. And of course, it's very fast. And so we see a rapid overland flow here and uh, then dropping off and things moving back into the subsurface afterwards. And then here's the event hydrograph coming from that. So uh, this can help us understand the changing flow pathways of water. And of course, we uh, don't have many gauged uh, uh, overland flow events with floods of this size. So if we calibrated a model to the typical snowmelt interflow through here, we would have had trouble with this. And uh, in uh, with the CRIM model, it's not calibrated. So uh, we still had trouble with it because we didn't have the right processes. We did not have the flow through snowpack processes working properly. So in this example, they've been added and we had much better performance. Uh, it also allows us to look at uh, interactions between soil moisture changes and uh, storage changes and flood runoff generation efficiency. If the efficiency is one, then all the precip went into stream flow. If it's 0.5, then half of the precip went into stream flow. And if it's two, then stream flow is twice the precip, which you say, hey, that, how's that possible? Well, of course it's possible through snowmelt. And here at the lower elevations in the forest, uh, we see that the uh, storage is going up and uh, the ability to generate stream flow is relatively low. It's less than one. As we get to higher elevations, it's approaching one and we get into the alpine and into the tree line. This is where the deep snow is. Then we see snowmelt contributions to this, um, which are uh, uh, adding to that. So uh, showing the importance of the rain on snow components uh, to that flood. Now, this is a little map of Marmot Creek. Uh, a lot of those studies were up in Fisera Ridge, I've showed you, and that's where the rain on snow area was in this part of the catchment. Um, um, John, we are yeah. almost running out of time. Can you please summarize? Yes, uh, I'll wrap up quickly. So we're able to set up a model for this sort of thing. And, uh, and then uh, downscale a climate model to look at the future for Marmot Creek. And here we see uh, substantial warming of up to five degrees by end of the century, but increased precipitation. So you see lower snowpacks at lower elevations and much earlier snowpacks and earlier snowmelt everywhere. But the impact on the hydrology is interesting. We have earlier uh, runoff regimes, but more flow coming from the basin because of the greater precip uh, occurring here. So it's mostly a change in timing and not so much the change in the peaks. We wanted to take that solution around the world, including to Nepal. So working with the Spanish government and Dr. Uh, Nacho Lopez Moreno, we set up virtual crim basins at 45 locations around the world, including Langtang catchment and Mustang catchment in Nepal. And, um, and then we, uh, we looked at their sensitivity uh, to warming of uh, how much does a ra rainfall ratio change per degree Celsius increase and you see in uh, some places high sensitivity, not so much in the cold Nepal area and uh, less in northern Canada, of course. And here's the sensitivity of peak snow water equivalent uh, to warming and uh, again, moderate sensitivity in Nepal, low in the cold regions, but very high sensitivity in the Andes and in the Mediterranean regions and uh, Australia and New Zealand. And then sensitivity to snow duration, again, uh, lower in uh, sensitive in Nepal, but very high in the Mediterranean and other areas. What we also found here is that the dry regions were less sensitive to climate warming than were very wet regions uh, because of the cooling impact of sublimation on the snow processes. So this paper is coming out in a few days in environmental research letters. And uh, what's interesting is the lower sensitivity of the stream flow regimes to warming than the snowpack regimes had and uh, very low in Langtang and Mustang in Nepal, um, uh, but the highest still in the Andes and uh, further north in China. So I'll wrap up quickly uh, and just show you a, a new model that we're working on. We call the Canadian Hydrological Model. 
It allows us to uh, uh, calculate in great detail the avalanching, blowing snow, snow interception over mountain regions. And um, we're now uh, starting to apply this over large areas. This is uh, Western Canada, British Columbia, and the Rockies. And you see it running over um, a vast area in this, in this example here. So I'll move to conclusions and a few thoughts that uh, snow hydrology is providing water for much of the world, but is greatly threatened by warming. Snow processes control the hydrology in these regions. I've mentioned a few of them for you as a bit of university lecture. The important thing is the coupling of the mass and energy fluxes and states, which mean that snow hydrology can be predicted using physical principles. And now that we're experiencing climate warming, we have problems with reduced redistribution, reduced sublimation losses, earlier snowmelt, changing melt rates, and decoupling of mountain and stream flow hydrographs from the snow regime. So that mountain hydrology is becoming more influenced by rainfall runoff and therefore becoming less reliable and actually more difficult to predict. So I'll wrap up and I thank you very much for according me this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. Sunil. Wait a moment. Uh, thank you, Professor Panmarai, for your nice presentation. Uh, now, I would like to welcome you all to the question and answer session. The time for this session is 15 minutes. And I have been informed that there are so many questions from the participants. So we apologize for not being able to incorporate all, all, all the questions uh, due to time constraint. But our co-hosts have tried their best and summarize the questions. So let me read uh, the first question. So it's from Mandira Singh Sister asking, you mentioned about fire that can leave dark deposits of soot in the snow and ice. Have there been in fact studies on this? Yes, uh, we've been studying the impact of fire on the melt of glaciers in the mountains in Canada. And um, the two things that happen, and they counterbalance each other. One is the deposition of soot onto the uh, ice, which reduces the albedo. We measured albedo last summer of 0.17 on glacier ice, is very low. Um, but then also, when the fires are burning, there's smoke in the atmosphere, and that reduces solar irradiance to the glacier. And the reduction in solar radiation almost completely balances the um, lower albedo uh, during those smoky days. So the melt rate only increases about 3%, not too much. But it's after the fire season. The glacier stayed dark. And it's because algae then colonized the glacier surface, feeding on the soot, and kept it dark for one, now two years after the fire season. And that's having a longer term and more profound impact on increasing uh, glacier ice melt for us. Okay, thank you. Another question is that last winter, North America along the Rocky Mountains was hit by extreme snowfall. How do you consider the effect of climate change on snowy events? Please. Yes, the, um, and in fact, for the future, some of our climate models show increased precipitation in the mountains. Um, which uh, can increase snowfall, but then wrap more rapid snow melt. So the, um, uh, and this year, yes, there's still snow patches that have not melted from that heavy snowfall in the Canadian Rockies. So the, uh, the variability uh, does appear to be increasing. And this year would be an example of that. Uh, we've also had some of the driest years. Uh, basically, since the century began, 20 years now, we've had the very wettest conditions and the very driest conditions in just a 20 year period compared to the 100 years before they uh, exceed those records. So the, uh, we're using a WARF model, WRF at four kilometer resolution to better understand this. And then we have a Canadian model called GEM, which we run at one kilometer resolution, which is helping us to calculate uh, these extreme snowfall events and uh, drive our hydrological models because we're also developing forecast models. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Hemu Kafle is asking, how long is the drought period in Canada and what are the probable regions? Please. The, uh, the, the drought period is, uh, uh, tends to be very short. We get droughts for one or two years. Um, we've had some bad ones in the 1930s. 
very bad, led to depopulation in Western Canada. And we had a very serious one 18 years ago, uh, which led to water shortages and difficulty in uh, supplying enough water to irrigate and, and generate hydroelectricity. But, the, uh, but we're quite lucky in general. I think our droughts are not nearly as bad as Australia or other places, but, uh, but they do occur. And the Rockies have generally been a reliable source of stream flow, even in these droughts so far. But the future could be different as we lose our glaciers. Okay, Suresh Maratta is asking, how accurate is snow measurement in Canada? What is the percentage of precipitation in the form of snow in general? And how much does inter interception by trees in fact on water balance in a study area? It's quite a long question. Yes, yes. Um, snowfall is about uh, two thirds of the precipitation in the high mountains there. And uh, uh, snow melt runoff is about 60% of the uh, total runoff or rainfall about uh, 40%. The um, interception losses are, the range from very small in the cold forest, 10%, but they can be as high as 50% uh, in the lower elevation forests. And so the, uh, that sublimation has to be taken into account to work out how much snow pack is available for melt in the spring. Okay, another question is about modeling. And Gunjan is asking, how big is the implication of blowing snow on regional hydrology in Canadian Rockies? Because most of the regional snow and glacier modeling studies do not account for the impact of blowing snow. How important is it to integrate the physical processes related with blowing snow, especially for regional hydrology modeling in the Canadian basins? Yes, uh, we have a uh, hydrological land surface scheme developed in Canada called MESH, M-E-S-H. It's using the class land surface scheme. And uh, we've recently adapted it for mountains. Uh, we call it mountain mesh. And uh, so we operate this at four kilometer resolution, but we have blowing snow in there. We have glaciers in there. We have slope and aspect, and we have elevation bands in the land surface scheme. And the uh, improvement and um, our ability to model the streams that are the Rockies was amazing. Uh, compared to the old flat surface mesh model, which did not include blowing snow. We found we had to include it in order to uh, get reliable results. We also found that we could restrict the calibration of mesh when we had the right processes in place. And so in the end, we just calibrate the hydraulic conductivity and some of the routing coefficients and the stomata resistance for one land cover type forest. And, uh, and the rest we can set from uh, known parameters. So it makes a more stable and robust model and it makes a much more accurate model. We were getting Nash Sutcliffe's of 0 0.87, 0 0.89 with this driven by wharf, not by station data. So uh, I'm very optimistic that if we have the right physics in these models, we get much better results and we need to do it. Okay, Amrit is asking, one of our studies carried out in the Himalayan catchment, we found that the modified temperature index model is equally as good as the physical model to simulate, simulate snow depth. Can you comment on this based on your experience? Can you recommend some models for understanding snow hydrology of the Himalayan catchment? Yes, um, the, uh, the development of energy balance snow models was pioneered at the University of Saskatchewan 50 years ago because uh, investigators found at that time, they simply did not work very well in this region. Um, I think people have found elsewhere the problems of the temperature index model. It's empirical, it's relating a cumulative, two cumulative functions, cumulative snow melt to cumulative temperature. And so time is related to time very well and it can appear to work well. Uh, in practice, when you look at this, it doesn't work for rain on snow. It cannot calculate sublimation losses. It cannot account for forest cover changes. It uh, doesn't work on slopes of different aspects and uh, or different elevations. And for any particular event, uh, if you try to back calculate the uh, degree day factor, uh, it can vary by orders of magnitude. So uh, my recommendation is not to use it. Uh, it's a dangerous thing and it has uh, a low predictive capacity and can actually fool us into thinking that we have a model that works where in reality it's just melting snow in the spring, which is what snow does. So uh, 
I think it's a dangerous thing that has set snow hydrology back several decades and we need to move beyond it uh, as a proper science. And the, uh, the, the techniques, the technologies are there to do the energy balance. There's no reason not to. Uh, another question is that we often heard about snow avalanches in the Himalayan catchment. Can you provide information about the models used for predicting snow avalanche? How reliable are these models for operational use? Yes, uh, we have a very simple model for avalanching built into the models I showed you there. It's uh, uh, developed by uh, Dr. Matthias Bernhardt and Karsten Schulz in the uh, Alps in Europe. And the, uh, it, it simply takes snow depth and angle of slope and removes uh, snow that is uh, beyond the thresholds in there. So very simple, but it's, uh, it, uh, for hydrological purposes, it works because we don't need to know exactly when the avalanche occurs. We just need to know that it did occur. And uh, so for us, that's enough. But I wouldn't use it to decide if an avalanche is going to come down on me or not. Um, so anyway, uh, these are easy to put into models. They're empirical, but they seem to work well in Canada as well as in Europe. And um, actually, Dr. Pardinanga was the one who introduced this into the CRIM model. And we're very grateful he did that. OK. Hemu and Amrit are asking, how does Chione? It is C S I O N E. How does Chione work? How accurate is it? Do you have automatic correction for the influence of air temperature on sound waves in your Chione sensor? What is the mm -hmm. maximum snow depth it can measure? Does this sensor provide bulk density of snowpack or something else, please? Okay, uh, many questions. Yes, the uh, Keone actually measures the temperature through the speed of sound, so it's not uh, affected by external air temperature. It, um, its accuracy is very high. We compare it to snow pits, which we think are the best measurement, and it's better than a snow tube. It's more accurate than a snow tube, uh, like uh, Mount Rose or ESC-30 in measuring snow density. Uh, and it compares very well to dielectric measurements of wetness. The, um, its uh, principle is using a reflection of a sound wave and then signal processing to extract the speed of sound through air, water, and ice in the snowpack. And, um, and so the, uh, it's able to measure the bulk density of snow very well, as well as through the depth estimate, the snow water equivalent, and then the liquid water content of the snowpack, as well as the temperature of the snowpack. It also measures the layering of the snowpack and measure, estimates these quantities in each layer and um, can pick up things that are buried in snow as well, like trees and rocks. So uh, it's uh, uh, still an experimental device, but we, uh, we hope someday that uh, someone will manufacture it. And because it's using sound, it's cheap. It's speakers and microphones. So uh, the first one we built with, uh, uh, we just went to a local electronic store to, to design. So it's, uh, I'm hoping these can be deployed around the world in time. Okay, Jason Gabriel Pija, Pinja is asking, do you plan to quantify the contribution of each hydrologic process in the same study area using isotope hydrology? Can you recommend some models for understanding snow hydrology of the Himalayan catchment, please? Yes, um, we have not made strong use of isotope hydrology uh, because of the uh, very complex fractionation effects of isotopes due to sublimation and due to melt uh, can sometimes be more complex than the snow hydrology itself. And so I've, I've used snow chemistry to better understand sublimation, uh, but isotopes less because of the, um, uh, the uh, uh, movements and fractionation occurring around the ice crystal during the melt period and sublimation can make interpretation of isotopic signals in snow hydrology very difficult to look at. The, um, and then in terms of uh, uh, snow hydrology studies in Nepal, I believe Dr. Pradnanga is starting up some uh, work in Langtang, uh, which uh, should be very promising, I think. And, the, um, and of course, there's a uh, long history of studies from Isimod and from Nepal universities and, and others in looking at snow as part of glaciated systems. Um, but there are opportunities or forests in, uh, in Western Nepal, which uh, uh, have influences on the hydrology, which would be good things to study, I think. And uh, of course, forest covers can change for many reasons. And so um, it's good to have a handle on their impact before those changes occur. 
the session is about to end, I would like to ask the last question to Professor Pamarai. The question is, the climate, the climatic characteristics in the Himalayan region may be different than the Canadian Rockies and European Alps. Himalayan region is also complex in terms of accessibility. In, in addition, this region is poor with database and recent technology. In this context, how we may apply your resource findings in this region and how we can integrate these resources with education, please. Yes, it's, um, and, and this is true. I mean, every mountain range and region of the world is different. Uh, uh, Canada is colder, Nepal is warmer, uh, has very wet regions, but also some, some dry areas like Mustang. Um, and so, but with different elevations, uh, one can usually find a similar mountain climate, uh, but at different elevations in different mountains. Uh, I think uh, some of the modeling and the process work we have is uh, can be uh, transferred over because it's physically based modeling. And so uh, driven by the physics, then uh, the physical laws themselves do not change. It's their boundary conditions and initial states uh, which change. And so the, uh, uh, I think, uh, d field investigations to confirm the operation of physically based models and then uh, deployment of automatic weather stations and high resolution uh, weather models to drive uh, some of the higher resolution hydrological models would be perhaps a good way forward and help you identify regions of special concern that require investigation. Thank you.